Welcome to the Sabbath School lesson of April 21st, 2012. The lesson entitled today is Man Transformed by God. If you would like, you can follow a link below this video and get a copy of the Sabbath School lesson material yourself. Um, if you don't have it already in booklet form, it's highly recommended that uh, the subject matter of the lesson is studied through carefully, that the particular points and texts that are applicable to ourselves are highlighted and underlined and extra comments written in, all of that which promotes the thinking capabilities of our mind to really study out the scriptures in detail. Man transformed by God. This man is, of course, Jacob. We studied Abraham, Isaac, now we consider Jacob. His life and his life experiences that he made and how that is applicable to us personally. Jacob and the story of his life is one that I guess many of us are reasonably familiar with. He was instrumental together with his mother in deceiving his almost blind father into giving the birthright and the blessing to himself, to Jacob, the younger son, instead of it should have, gen generally it should have gone to the older, it should have gone to Esau. But because Rebecca had in her mind the words of an angel that said that the, the older would serve the younger, therefore she knew that or had in the back of her mind that Jacob should be the one to receive the birthright. And as such, she was instrumental in instigating Jacob uh, to deceive his father and to obtain the birthright by fraud. And this was not God's will. It was not God's plan at all. And this fraudulent act, as we see in the lesson, had consequences that lasted through the entire of Jacob's life. Never once was he free from seeing the consequences of those actions. The note under question one really describes to us the scene as it took place when Jacob and Rebekah worked together to deceive their father and what that caused. It says there, the note under question one says, Jacob and Rebekah succeeded in their purpose, but they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. God had declared that Jacob should receive the birthright and his word would have been fulfilled in his own time had they waited in faith for him to work for them. But like many who now profess to be the children of God, they were unwilling to leave the matter in his hands, in God's hands. Rebecca bitterly repented the wrong counsel she had given her son and it was a means of separating him from her and she never saw his face again. How disastrous are the consequences of one seemingly small deception? A lie told, no one will ever know. But what were the consequences? The consequences were that they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. Did, they, did Jacob actually receive a blessing? Isaac pronounced the blessing on Jacob. Isaac gave the birthright to Jacob. But did Jacob actually receive the birthright? Jacob had to flee from the land of his father to a foreign land where he owned nothing. He went out of his father's house with nothing to his name, only the clothes on his back, completely bankrupt of anything. He had no birthright, he had no blessing, he had nothing because he had desired to obtain the birthright by fraud. And as it says there, how often do the professed children of God today in our generation, how often are we also unwilling to leave a matter in the hands of God? God would have worked out some way or another that Jacob would have received the birthright and not Esau. We don't know how he would have done that because Jacob took things into his own hands and as a result, the course of history was changed. And the consequences of that action are very carefully delineated in this lesson. First of all, it says, as we just read in the note there, that Rebecca, Jacob's mother, never saw Jacob again. She died before Jacob returned 
from Haran and came back to his father's house. And as such, she never saw him. Reading also the note under question two, it says of Jacob, a homeless fugitive, separated from his mother, whom he never saw again, laboring seven years for, for her whom he loved, for the one that was to be his wife, only to be basely cheated, toiling 20 years in the service of a covetous and grasping kinsman, seeing his wealth increasing, the sun's rising round him, but finding little joy in the consequences and uh, but finding little joy in the contentious and divided household, distressed by his daughter's shame, by his brother's revenge, by the death of Rachel, by the unnatural crime of Reuben, by Judah's sin, by the cruel deception and malice practiced towards Joseph. How long and dark is the catalogue of evil spread out to view. Again and again he had reaped the fruit of that first wrong deed. These consequences which Jacob was made to suffer under was not something that he only suffered while he was in Haran, away from his father's house. These consequences went with Jacob for the rest of his life. As long as life shall last, we will sometimes need to bear and carry the consequences of wrong actions that we have committed. It is true, God forgives us. And God did forgive Jacob as we study in the lesson. And all guilt was removed. But even after that time, even when Jacob was thoroughly converted, even after that, the consequences still came and troubled Jacob. These consequences, it is not God's place to fully remove. For it is important that those consequences, as we see in Jacob's life, will be a reminder and will be a, a guard and a protection to prevent us from going presumptuously into our own way, as did Jacob. Another consequence of Jacob's um, deception is that found in the verse under question 2 in Genesis 27 verse 41 it says and Esau hated Jacob Esau hated him and he went so far in his hatred to say later on in that same verse it says the days of mourning for my father are at hand then will I slay my brother Jacob Esau knew that his father was old and would very shortly pass away and Esau thought in his heart, when my father passes away, then I will hunt down and kill my brother Jacob. What a dire consequence that set the scene for the remainder of Jacob's life, especially as we consider Jacob's return from exile, Jacob's return to his father's house. Esau was desiring nothing more than to slay Jacob at the first opportunity to kill him because he hated him. And we see here the, the close connection between hating a brother and killing a brother. When the scripture says, thou shalt not kill. If we hate a brother or foster negativity towards a brother or sister, if we let something dwell in our heart which causes division between brothers and sisters, this is breaking the commandment, thou shalt not kill. We see that as Jacob fled from his father's house to go unto his uncle's house, which was the brother of his mother, he went to Laban's house in Haran, which was up on the on the northern end of the river Euphrates. It was a long way away from where they dwelt. But as he was on the way there, he had a particular experience. We know that the testimony of Jacob was that he was very much suffering under depression. He was very much in a place in his life where he did not want to go on. He, he had no hope for tomorrow. He had no, nothing to look forward to. He knew how great his sin was. He was acutely aware of 
how terrible a sinner he was. And he desired nothing more than to die, as was even Elijah's experience at one time. But here we see in the note under question three, it says the darkness and despair pressed upon his soul and he hardly dared to pray. He, did, he hardly even dared to lift up his voice to God and to pray. Pray to the God of the heavens that he had known and that had spoken to his father and to his grandfather. But Jacob hardly dared to pray. Yet he did pray because it continues on there. It says, but he was so utterly lonely that he felt the need of protection from God as he had never felt it before. With weeping and deep humiliation, he confessed his sin and entreated for some evidence that he was not utterly forsaken. Have you ever been, or perhaps are you at present, in a kind of situation where the soul is pressed down with darkness and despair, as was that of Jacob? Anyone who has gone through that experience, anyone who is going through that experience, can really appreciate what Jacob went through and to gain courage from the lesson and the help that Jacob received. As we go through that kind of experience, we come to a realisation of one thing. One realisation that we come to. It says there, as we read, he was so utterly lonely that he felt the need of protection from God as he had never felt it before. When we come into those difficult circumstances of real depression, where we see no hope for tomorrow, no future whatsoever, when the darkness and despair of life presses down our soul and we hardly dare to pray, then we come to that one realisation that more than ever before, we need God. We need help. We need something that we don't even know what we need but we know that God can provide it somehow. And indeed he does. What was it exactly that Jacob needed? Reading the, last, the remainder of that note under question three, it says, God did not forsake Jacob. His mercy was still extended to his erring, distrustful servant. The Lord compassionately revealed just what Jacob needed. What was that? The Lord compassionately re revealed just what Jacob needed, a saviour, it says. Jacob needed a saviour. Jacob needed a brother who would be able to come and help him out of the affliction that he found himself in. And that saviour was revealed to Jacob in the vision of the ladder. The ladder that reached from earth all the way up to heaven. And angels were ascending and descending upon that ladder. That ladder is representative of Jesus Christ. That the connecting link was made between earth and heaven. And that connecting link is what helps us out of our despondent situation. When we realise that the, the wrongs that I've committed, just as Jacob realised, that the wrongs that I've committed are so great that I hardly dare to pray when I come to a realisation that I have nothing in this life to offer, when we come all broken hearted before the Lord, then it is that God is able to reveal to us a saviour who is tempted in all points like as we are, who knows the infirmities and the afflictions wherewith we are beset and he's able to come and to help to succor, it says, those who are tempted, those who are afflicted, those who are struggling, those who are depressed. Jesus went through the same circumstances as you and I. This saviour was revealed to Jacob and Jacob was encouraged as a result and he went on to the house of Laban in Haran and there he worked and God blessed him. He gained quite some wealth. 
he married twice because he was de- uh, he was cheated on his first wife and so he married the second time to gain the the wife whom he originally loved the life of Jacob in Haran was one of difficulty and perplexity and the time came when Jacob desired to return home again and as he desired to return home he came to a realization that I guess as he was approaching near his father's house that that Esau probably still hated him that Esau probably was still desiring to kill him and with this realization and with a renewed understanding of how great his original sin was in deceiving his brother in taking the matters of God into his own hands in forcing the matters of God realizing how great this sin was caused Jacob a new measure of distress we know that the distress which Jacob now faced was different from the first because the first Jacob was was completely destitute but at this time when Jacob was returning from Haran he had received blessings from the Lord the Lord had guided him and had directed him and Jacob had some level of progress in his life but yet he was not yet completely free from the consequences of his original deception and those consequences were now plaguing him it says in the note under question four it says Jacob had a great crisis in his life it's sorry Jacob in the great crisis of his life turned aside to pray he was filled with one overmastering purpose to seek for transformation of character but but while he was pleading with God an enemy as he supposed placed his hand upon him and all night he wrestled for his life but the purpose of his soul was not changed by peril of life itself Jacob when in this crisis was filled with one overpowering overmastering purpose what was that purpose a transformation of character now the parallels that exist between the life of Jacob and the life of the average sincere Christian are quite remarkable the timing may be different the time frame of each event may vary but the actual the process of the events is quite remarkable I find it applies very much to my own life perhaps to you to yours as well Jacob had been blessed of the Lord he had been promised the birthright and as such he grew up as his mother's favorite son he had been especially blessed that he would receive the birthright even though he was the youngest in the same way that we have been especially blessed when we come to the Lord we receive an, a new measure of zeal enthusiasm fire for the Lord and this invigorates our life spiritually and we follow after the Lord zealously and as we do so sometimes things are done in our life which perhaps we didn't seek counsel of the Lord of perhaps we went slightly deviated from what the word says perhaps we didn't listen to the counsel of those who were older and more experienced in the church in the faith whatever the reason sometimes we take matters into our own hands and as a result we go on a tangent from the original path that God desired for us to walk along and as we go on that tangent even though things are not quite right in our life the Lord is able to bring us back to that original path in the same way that Jacob made a detour and went to Haran for 20 years but then after some time the Lord brought him back again but then as Jacob 
came back after spending so much time in a in a heathen land in a in a country where they worship where they didn't worship God Jacob's overwhelming desire his passion his his the thing that he wanted more than anything else in the world was a transformation of character and the same it is with us when we realize that our feet have been leading us astray that for some reason or another we have found ourselves in a way which is not according to God's direction then it is that we come to a, a sense a realization that the one thing that I desire more than anything else is that this sinful wicked character of mine would be transformed that God would work in my life to bring about a change such as I have never felt before and Jacob really yearned for that change we all need to yearn for that change that transformation of character and as he did a hand placed upon his shoulder and Jacob immediately thought it's an enemy perhaps one of Esau's men come to take his life who knows but Jacob fought and he fought for many hours until it says there uh, continuing reading in the note under question four where we left off when this when his strength was nearly spent the angel put forth his divine power and his and at his touch Jacob knew him with whom he had been contending because at the touch of the angel Jacob his hip was put out of place and he became paralyzed Jacob knew that he had been contending with Jesus Christ the Son of God so it is in our own experience that as we deviate and go off on a ten tangent away from the Lord taking matters into our own hands perhaps still Christian perhaps still coming to church but for some reason or another our heart is not in serving God our heart is in the pursuit of our own pleasures and then we come to a point where we find ourselves wrestling against an enemy only to realize that we are in fact fighting against God and it is impossible for us to defeat God and yet we fight against God and when we come to that realization that we have been fighting against God that we have been battling against the Son of God then it is that we come fully into the appreciation of Jacob's experience it says there wounded and helpless he fell upon the Savior's breast pleading for a blessing now the the God of heaven had already greatly blessed Jacob while he was in Haran he was quite wealthy so much so that Laban continually tried to change the wages of Jacob because he saw Jacob getting wealthier and wealthier but nevertheless even though Jacob had received all this blessing from the Lord now it was that it says that he was pleading for a blessing the other the temporal that is nothing in the eyes of God God wants to bless us in a way which far supersedes a nice house a nice car a nice wife or husband all these temporal things are great but God wants to bless us in a completely different way and remember that the blessing that Jacob was pleading for was that transformation of character that is what was foremost on his mind continuing on it says he would not be turned aside nor cease his intercession and Christ gain, and Christ granted the petition of his help of his helpless penitent soul according to his promise let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me Jacob right here at this moment made peace with God even though already back in Bethel when he was leaving his father's house to go to Haran even back then 20 years earlier 
he had received the vision and had understood something of the Saviour and gained a level of peace. But it was only at this point when the heart of Jacob was completely broken before the Lord, when every aspect of self was removed, when he was completely helpless, falling at the Saviour's feet. It was then that it says that he made peace with God. The same it is for us. If we desire to make peace with God, then we need to come before the Lord altogether helpless, free from every taint of self, only for the one purpose, for the transformation of character, to be more like Christ. This persis persistence was inspired by him who wrestled with the patriarch. It was he who gave him the victory and he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. It was Christ himself that gave Jacob the persistence that he manifested. We also need to manifest a great level of persistence. When difficulties come in our spiritual walk, when doubts arise, when fears, temptations assail, whatever comes our way, we need to have the persistence, the determination, the, the zeal that nothing will deviate, nothing will cause me to deviate from the one focus of my mind, and that is the transformation of character. And if we have that persistence, then we will also gain the peace and the future blessings that Jacob was a partaker of. Now, the name of Jacob was changed. Jacob was now known as Israel. The Son of God himself gave him that new name. Because Jacob, the name, means supplanter. You can read that in the margin in the King James Bible under Genesis 27 verse 36. Jacob means supplanter. And a supplanter is a bit of an older term, but it means one who pushes another out to take his place. For example, a young king or a young, uh, maybe the brother of a king, might become a supplanter by pushing the king out and taking the throne. And this is precisely what Jacob did. He pushed his brother out from the blessing and the birthright and took that blessing and birthright himself. And so he was the supplanter. He was the deceiver. And this name was taken from him when the, when the guilt was taken from him. And his name was changed to Israel. Why Israel? His name was changed to Israel because it says, As a prince thou hast power with God and with men and has prevailed. Jacob, now Israel, had power with God and with man, and he prevailed. He came off victorious. He had made peace with God, and the next day, or very shortly after, he made peace with his brother. He had prevailed in the forces of evil in regards to spiritual things and in regards to relations with one another with brother and sister in this case with his own brother this same battle is for us to fight as well if we would be a part of spiritual israel we must be a partaker of the same experience that jacob was that we would have power with god and with men and that we would prevail as a prince, if Jacob was a prince, if we are to be a partake of that same experience as spiritual Israel, we are also to be princes of the king of heaven, heirs to his kingdom, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. This is what the scripture re reveals to us as what are the, the blessings that lie before us. But it is required that we need to gain the victory in spiritual battles and also in battles of human relationships. Because the spiritual battles that take place in our minds 
where we need to directly battle against the temptations and the forces of Satan that come against us to lead us astray into sin. These battles are one thing, but on the other hand, we also have difficulties and problems that we need to face when brothers and sisters perhaps cause offence, perhaps there's some, there's some roughness in the church, perhaps there's some, some people that uh, don't deal very kindly with one another, and all these kind of situations need to be dealt with in a manner which reveals a genuine peace that we are peacemakers, as we had in a previous lesson. It continues on here that this new nature which Jacob received as a result of as a result of falling helpless at the feet of Jesus, this new nature is also to be our nature. And if we consider right back at the beginning, under question 1, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And here under question 5, it reveals to us this kind of new nature, which is after the spiritual, not after the natural man. It says in Ephesians 4.24, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When the heart is cleansed from sin, this is the note under question five, when the heart is cleansed from sin, Christ is placed on the throne that self-indulgence and love of earthly treasure once occupied. The image of Christ is seen in the expression of his countenance. The work of sanctification is carried forward in the soul. Self-righteousness is banished. There is seen the putting on of the new man, which after Christ is created in righteousness and true holiness. When the heart is cleansed from sin, that is when Christ is placed on the throne where self-indulgence and love of earthly treasure once occupied. What occupies the throne in your heart? Who dwells there? Who reigns there? When you're in the secret chambers of your own home, your own bedroom, your own private corner, wherever it might be, what do you love to think about? What do you love to read? What do you love to watch, to see? Where are your affections? This is the revelation of whether we are partakers of this transformation of character or whether we are still outside that experience, longing to get in. Jacob was for many years outside that experience. For 20 years in Haran, he was destitute and distant from that experience of the new birth. Intellectually, he understood. Intellectually, he knew that the Saviour would come and, and that the Saviour was that connecting link between earth and heaven. But in his heart, as far as ex his experience goes, for 20 years he was wondering where, why. There was no peace for him until he came through this experience. Great, the greatest manifestation, it continues on under question 5 in the note, the greatest manifestation that men and women can make of the grace and power of Christ is made when the natural man becomes a partaker of the divine nature and through the power that the grace of Christ imparts overcomes the corruption that is in the world through lust. This corruption we need to overcome and Christ strengthens us to gain this victory. But the victory, we can only begin on the path of victory when Self is completely destroyed. When no ounce of self is cherished, when everything that I once held dear, whether it is pride in this world, whether it is earthly treasure, doesn't matter what it is, when all these things are completely taken from us, then it is that the process 
of overcoming the corruption that is in the world through lust, this process begins and starts to bring forth fruit in our life. Question six, very briefly, deals with Esau making peace. Uh, sorry, it deals with Jacob making peace with Esau. And when Jacob came, he sent gifts of cattle before him to meet Esau. And when he met Esau, Esau saw him limping, still in pain from his wrestle with the angel. And Esau's heart was softened towards his brother. And they embraced and wept. And what a wonderful reunion that was. And Jacob felt the peace of heaven flood over him. This same peace we can also feel when we make peace with our brothers and sisters. When we put away all differences and in humility and self-surrender come before the Lord. The note under question six says, Jacob had received the blessing for which his soul had longed. His sin as a supplanter and deceiver had been pardoned. The crisis in his life was past. Doubt, perplexity and remorse had embittered his experience. But now all was changed and sweet was the peace of reconciliation with God. Jacob no longer feared to meet his brother. God, who had forgiven his sin, could move the heart of Esau also to accept his humiliation and repentance. Indeed, that is precisely what happened. God had moved the heart of Esau to accept and to see and accept the repentance of Jacob. And it was only when Jacob was, was completely determined to let go of everything of self, even to let go of the birthright, to let go of the blessing, he wanted nothing of that. He was determined to let Esau have everything. All his wealth he sent before him as gifts for Esau. He wanted nothing. All he wanted was to be at peace with his brother. To be at peace with God and at peace with his brother. And this spirit touched the heart of Esau. And it, as it says, the sweet peace, as sweet was the peace of reconciliation with God. That sweet peace, the Lord wants us to be partakers of. Question 7 includes the verse of Revelation 3, verse 12. Under question 7, it says in that verse, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. To him that overcometh, you and me, to, if, we are, if we remain faithful, the Lord will write upon us the name of the God of heaven. And what is that name? In Jeremiah 23, verse 6, it says that name is the Lord our righteousness. That is his name. His name is the Lord our righteousness. And this name shall be written upon us, that we would be called by the same, the Lord our righteousness. Because nothing that we have done, none of our own actions, have anything to do with righteousness. They are but filthy rags. Righteousness is only the Lord's, for he alone is righteous. And if Christ is a part of my life, then Christ's righteousness is a part of my life. And that's why when God is called righteous, his saints will also be known, the Lord, our righteousness. And that is the name that is written Upon them, says, I will write upon him the name of my God, which is the Lord our righteousness, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. And what does the name Jerusalem mean? If you look carefully what that name means, Jeru 
Salem. Salem or Salem means peace. And Jeru means city. City of peace or dwelling of peace. Jerusalem means the city of peace. God wants us to be pillars in his temple. Pillars in the temple of the new Jerusalem. Why? Because we will go through an experience like that of Jacob, where we will come absolutely destitute with nothing to offer before the Lord, completely broken and selfless, completely empty of anything. Everything we have we will give away for the one purpose, with one goal upon our mind, wanting nothing more than the transformation of character. And as we make that experience, as we come to that point, we will gain peace with God. As we read in the previous note, doubt and perplexity and remorse, though it has embittered our experience, just as it did Jacob's, as it has embittered our experience, but all will be changed. As we surrender to God, everything will be changed in our life. The doubt, the perplexity, the remorse will be removed and sweet will be the peace of reconciliation with God. My wish and prayer for each one of us is that we will be reconciled with God. And we read clearly in the scripture that this is not something that happens once in our life at first conversion or at baptism. This is something that is renewed every day. The spirit of self-surrender, of self-renunciation, is a spirit with which we need to wake up in the morning and a spirit which must be last on our thoughts at night. That everything that we have done has only been God working in us. If I have done anything of self, if I have made any plans without considering God, they have been of self and are as filthy rags, no matter how highly esteemed they are amongst men. Let us come before the Lord every day and let us be a partaker of Jacob's experience. We read in the scripture that those going through the final trial on this earth will go through the experience of Jacob's trouble. And what kind of experience is that? It's an experience that is described in the, in the books of the prophets as every man hold, bent over, holding their belly as though they were with child, in pain, in agony, just as Jacob was. Jacob was in agony because he felt that his sins were not forgiven. He felt that he was not at peace with God. And indeed he wasn't. But we today, if we hear his voice, and if we harden not our hearts, have an opportunity today to make peace with God. So that when we come to the time of Jacob's trouble, that even though we will have anguish, but our hearts will be right with God and he will come and save us for he is our God. May this be your experience. I pray it will be mine. Amen.